My friend's dad was a high-ranking officer in Newport, Rhode Island, and he told me of a night where he and one other officer were patrolling Ocean Drive in a squad car. This is a very normal route as local kids like to ODBC, Ocean Drive Blunt Cruise, so there's usually one officer parked or patrolling the windy road at any given time. It was a dark night, and they reported seeing a tall truck about a hundred yards away with multiple lights out, driving away from them. They could only see what appeared to be one functioning light on the back of the car. Upon approaching, the car sped up. The officers kept their distance and decided to tail the truck before turning on the lights and signaling it to pull over. They followed it all the way along Ocean Drive and up to Bellevue Avenue. As soon as they got to Bellevue, the street lights revealed that there was no truck at all but rather just this light hovering about 8 to 10 feet above the road. They kept following it through the campus of Sav Regina and all the way into Middletown. They kept following the light down Paradise Avenue, another dark road, coincidentally where Nicholas Cage owned a house. They were still keeping their distance, as I'm sure I would have too, but then decided to get a bit closer. The light turned down Prospect Avenue and then left again down a dead-end road. By the time the officers turned down the dead-end road, the light had vanished. They hung around the dead end slash trailer park road for about half an hour before leaving. They never figured it out. Imagine having to explain that to your superiors. We've left the jurisdiction to follow a mysterious floating light. I remember my father telling me a story about when he was a police officer in New Hampshire. One night, Dispatch gets a call from someone reporting having seen a little girl wandering around a lake by herself. That night, my father was on duty and every available police officer responded to try and find this little girl. My father was the first to arrive with his partner. As they exit their car, they slowly start to walk toward the lake. As they near the water, my father's partner hits him on the shoulder and points towards the lake where there stands this little girl. My father said when he turned to see her standing in the water, every hair on the back of his neck stood up once he saw her. It was 2 a.m. in November, so it was very cold outside. He said she was in a white nightgown with no shoes, standing in the water. They both looked at each other, knowing that something wasn't right about this situation. They reported to dispatch that they found the girl. They walk a little closer, and my father kneels down and holds his arms out, calling for the girl to come to him. The little girl then turns her attention to my father and slowly starts to walk towards him from out of the water. As this is happening, another unit pulls up to witness this girl walking up to my father. Just as the little girl was within eight feet of my father, she disappeared and there was nothing left but tiny little footprints in the dirt. They all stand there in disbelief, trying to figure out what just happened, and one of the police officers turns and says, how the F are we going to explain this? I was a 911 call taker 10 years ago when I received one of the creepiest calls ever. It was freezing that night, which usually meant a calm, quiet shift due to even the criminals not wanting to go outside. Around 3 a.m., my call box popped up green, and as usual, I asked what the emergency was. A man started frantically screaming that his spirit was possessed by a demon and was trying to cut his heart while he slept. He had fled when the attack started and locked himself in his bathroom. I asked him a series of questions, trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Every time he tried to answer, I heard what sounded like scratching and banging on the bathroom door. He whispered, there is a demon in my sister's body. It has been battling me for days. It got free from the chains, I swear, what I heard next chilled me to the core. This unearthly voice began taunting my collar through the door. It didn't sound like a 20-something woman. It was low and guttural, 
like she had gargled razor blades before speaking. She continued to growl and speak in a strange language until police arrived. She let out a terrifying scream when the officers broke in, then dead silence. The call was over. I was shaking and had to know what happened. Even my supervisor, who had been listening to the call in real time, was pale and speechless when the line abruptly ended. Before my shift ended, the commanding officer on my creepy call called in to tell me what they found. He told me he would have nightmares for the rest of his life. Apparently, when my caller said his sister got out of her chains, he wasn't joking around. She still had a chain tied to a bloody handcuff when the officers came in. Her whole body was covered in self-inflicted scratches. Her one eye had popped a blood vessel and was bright red. Most of what she was wearing was also shredded, and her skin looked like she had been drained of her blood. She was taken in for a psych consult and, as you probably guessed, stayed there for a long time. The brother was okay except for deep gouges in his chest. His sister literally tried to dig out his heart. There was some talk about arresting the brother, but nothing ever came of it. I still vividly remember that voice. It still makes my blood run cold. I know of plenty of stories of military police responding to paranormal at Fort Devens, central massachusetts back when it was still around in the 1980s there were many cases where the mps actually discharged their weapons entirely at what turned out to be nothing for those who have asked for more information there are so many stories i don't even know where to begin the fort devon cemetery contains many nazi one of whom invented the cruise missile and italian pals as well as civil war pals there have been plenty of sightings in that cemetery. The most sighted ghost is known as Ghost George, who I guess was in the army during the Civil War. He did something wrong and was chained up outside, and when they came back he was dead. Specifically, buildings were more haunted than most. In particular, P-11 and P-13. My father was a contractor on the base for many years, and he was not a believer in the paranormal but witnessed things and heard from others about many things. Army intelligence had a lot of Fort Devons, so he thinks that a lot of the ghost stories were really just made up so people would be too freaked out to investigate things there. The creepiest story from Fort Devons that I know of at least it is dark out. My father is leaving the Army Intelligence Building, the name of which I cannot remember. Because of what the building holds, he has to be escorted by MPs throughout the building. There are two sets of gates to get in. Inside the building, there is a huge vault room where a lot of sensitive information is stored. Walking between the two gates when the alarm goes off in the vault. So both sets of gates close and everyone heads to the building. My father and two MPs are stuck in the middle of both gates and cannot go anywhere. These gates and fences go high into the air with razor wire so no one can scale them. While stuck in the middle of both sides, he and the MPC and, as they say, feel something clear across the fence. They all believe to this day that something jumped over them towards the building. Eventually, MPs get to the vault room, where no one has been in hours because it is sealed. They open it and the room is trashed. The military response is Ghost George. Second edit. There was also a lot of strange stuff that happened with ritual killings. There was one housing unit where everyone that lived in it died within months of moving in. In November 2006, County Officer Sean Hefeli was sent to the 200 block of Runyon Avenue to check on a family not heard from for several days. He was shot twice by Tony Lynn, a resident who was killed by a police sniper after a five-hour standoff. Three days after that, relatives found the bodies of Lynn's grandmother and two of her children, initially overlooked by police, in a basement closet. 
When Hefele returned to work months later, fellow officers told him of 911 hang-up calls received from the home, even though its phone was disconnected. He felt compelled to look for himself. It looked like a house from Nightmare on Elm Street, Hefele explained. Windows were boarded up. Electricity was shut off. Four symbolic crosses were planted on the lawn. On a later night, flashlight in hand, he worked his way inside and things got weird. He saw a Ouija board with a marker over the letter U. It was like it was pointing at me, he said. The smell of tear gas still hung in the basement. Wine glasses lined a bar. A cold breeze ran past him as he approached the closet where the bodies were found. It made the hairs on my neck and arms stand up, he remembered. I said what I wanted to say to the victims and then just ran out of there. It felt like something was constricting me. I felt like somebody was there watching me the whole time. Hefeli, now a police officer in Jacksonville, Illinois, said he was told the 911 hang-up ceased after his visit. I was a police officer in a small town outside of Boston about 30 years ago. One October night, around dusk, the police station got a call that there had been a murder on a local golf course. I drove out with my partner to check it out. The sun had set by the time we had arrived. We were immediately approached by a short, middle-aged man who demanded to be arrested for murder. Apparently, he had been golfing and one of his shots had accidentally struck someone who had been walking through the course in the head. As my partner and I approached the body of the victim, which was lying flat on the course, the corpse sat straight up. Startled, we instinctively drew our weapons, but before any shots were fired, the body flopped back down and resumed its original position. The victim was in fact dead. We found out later from the medical examiner that what we witnessed was a type of post-mortem reflex. At the time, it sure seemed like a paranormal experience. I never got the full science behind it. I was just glad I didn't have to explain to my captain how we repeatedly shot corpses a few days before Halloween. My best friend's mother is a police officer, but she also took jobs patrolling businesses in downtown Houston. These businesses would be in old, renovated homes from the early 1900s. She told us some stories of her encounters with ghosts in the house. Sometimes, when she was on the upstairs balcony, she would go down the spiral staircase and she would be pushed, as if someone meant for her to fall down the stairs. Luckily, she was on guard, so she did not actually fall. Also, she has seen faces in the upstairs windows of a little boy. Her car alarm will go off when she is 10 feet away from it. Doors would lock behind her, she would hear footsteps, bang on the wall, open doors that were locked, and so on. I went there once, it had a creepy atmosphere. I've had some nutty calls over my career. I think every town has one of the tin foilers living there. One town I used to work for had numerous ones. One lady called every so often to complain about people coming into her house and keeping her up at night. She said they would come in around midnight and start making noise in her attic. We never found anything, and unfortunately, the tin foil over the windows trick didn't help her. Another woman was the proverbial cat lady. She'd called quite often about people coming into her house and stealing things. Trust me, there wasn't much visible that would be worth stealing from that apartment. In the old church in the town I currently work in, lights would randomly turn on and off in an old church. You'd go past the church at 10 PM and the lights would be off. But a few hours later, the lights in the bell tower or nearby rooms would be on. We went to investigate that issue four or five times and never found anything. 
What we did find out was that the church burned down half a century earlier, and a number of children were killed in the fire because they couldn't escape the nursery in the basement, and the story went that one of the kids was deathly afraid of the dark. I was also sent on a welfare check on the resident of a house I'd never seen before. The house was tucked back off a main road, and when I first pulled up, it had creepy, haunted-ass house written all over it. I made my way inside, looking for the elderly woman that supposedly hadn't been heard from in a week. It was a large, dark wooden interior, with old, musty curtains drawn over the filth-covered windows. It was very dark, and the air had a suffocating feel to it. The house had three floors and was more like a mini mansion than a typical residence. I didn't smell death, and I was hoping I didn't run across a fresh body. We made it through the house, announcing police and waiting for a response. But there was nothing. We got to the third floor. I see a door ajar in the foot of a bed. I could tell from where I was that it was one of those old types of canopy beds with the covering on it. I also saw the TV was on with no volume. I figured there was going to be a dead old lady in the bed. I got closer and saw a foot peeking out of the blanket. I thought, I hate finding dead people. I called out police and didn't get a response. I and the other guy with me both said damn at the same time and went into the room. There she was. Lying on her back, all pale and peaceful looking. I walked over to her to see if she had a pulse. I reached out to check her neck and she sat straight up and let out some kind of screeching banshee yell. My partner fell back over his own feet. I screamed like a girl and stumbled back. It turns out she was deaf and didn't realize we were there or anyone was worried about her. Dispatchers dropped the ball on that one and forgot to tell us she was deaf. Luckily, none of us died of a heart attack on the spot. Most recently, I was sent to a house where a mom called and said her six-year-old saw a man on the stairs. We rushed over, checked it out, and didn't find anything. The kid swears he saw a man on the stairs. I totally believe him because I know that kids can actually see more than we can when it comes to spirits and such. The mom apologized profusely, and I told her not to worry, maybe her kid is gifted. She looked at me like I had five heads and said, you may be right. I don't believe it, but he's seen things a bunch of times now. This time the door was open, so I wanted to make sure it wasn't a real intruder but he's seen people upstairs too. My boyfriend is a cop. A few nights ago, they got a call from a woman saying there was something in her closet. Everyone thought it was going to be a BS call. It turns out there was a man in the closet who was attempting to kidnap one of her kids. Worse than a ghost. In the late 70s and early 80s, my great uncle was the county sheriff of the county where my hometown is. As a matter of fact, all three of his sons also work for the sheriff's department, and one of them is still employed as a deputy. My great uncle passed away a few years ago from a heart attack, he smoked cigars every day for years. After he retired from the force, he started up a contract security company because he still had that itch to be doing police-like work. At one time, the company itself was very well off in the county here, and they contracted security staff to lots of places, mostly factories and our local hospital, but they'd also get offers to do private rallies, to assist with high-profile figures that came to this part of the state, etc. It was just extra manpower, if and when it was needed. I got a job offer from my uncle just a few days after I graduated from high school to begin working at our hospital as a contracted security officer. I started in late June of 2002 and worked there for five and a half years before the hospital redid policies, decided to go in-house with security, and didn't renew our contracts. My chief during that time was an awesome, awesome guy, 
and I still talk to him often to this day because he's just a good person. He's worked for the sheriff, the highway patrol, and the regular PD, and he hated dealing with all of the people around here, so he took the position as the head of the security company for my uncle. My uncle was basically just a pencil pusher at this point, signing checks, etc., and so my chief ran the basic day-to-day -day operations of everything. My chief was a hilarious guy, but when things got rough, he was also a no-nonsense, I'll knock your dick in the dirt type of guy. I worked solely at our hospital and was never sent to any other facilities to work. The main desk was located in one of the newer buildings, as the hospital had been renovating for a couple of years. The building that used to sit at this location was built in the mid-1800s and housed the original psychiatric department for the hospital. Before the late 1970s and early 90s, many psychiatric hospitals had very, very poor treatment of patients. Our hospital was no different. There are pictures of the old psych ward. With electroshock chairs, water treatment, torture, tables with chains and straps, and all sorts of other stuff that looked like it was straight out of a horror movie. This building was torn down about 10 years before I began working, and the new one was built, housing the new ER and what would become the diagnostics, cancer, and heart centers in the future. I began work in 2002. After about a year of employment, I was at the front desk where our cameras were housed and got a call on the radio from my chief, informing all units that a man and woman had been spotted getting on the trauma elevator that was in the building I just described. This particular elevator was right down the hall from me, so I responded by taking the stairs up to the third floor and began scouring for unauthorized people. As I had said, there are cameras on that floor because the renovations were underway and no one other than certain staff, i.e., our security and maintenance departments, were to be on the third floor at all. If you tried to enter the third floor, where most of the construction equipment was, you wouldn't be able to open the door slash elevator door, as you needed a key pass to get to that location. But I checked everything out anyway, and didn't find anything. About a month later, my boss pulled me aside to talk to me about the situation. He showed me the tapes of the floor, and you can clearly see me come out of the hallway where the elevator opens up. I come around the corner to the right, and begin walking towards the cameras. You see me unlock, enter, and check each door in that section of the floor, two doors on the right, three on the left. Inside these doors were just big empty rooms with drywall hanging up, tons of tools lying all over, and nothing else. It is basically being used as storage. But the tape doesn't stop there. As you see me come out of the last room, I continue down the hallway, coming towards the camera, and eventually pass the camera and exit the emergency stairwell to continue my search on the second floor. About two minutes after I disappear, a man and a woman come into focus coming down the hallway towards the camera. They look like a typical couple, mid-forties or so. The man was dressed in jeans and a blue sweatshirt, and the woman had on an old-style gown that our hospital no longer used. They enter the rooms on the left through the middle door, which I had just opened with a key that only security and maintenance have. They enter the room, the door closes, and nothing else shows on the camera. At all for the rest of the day. Those people never came out of the room, and my boss watched the footage through the next day, and nobody ever left the room. To this day, we still don't know who it was or how it happened. He's told me stories of things he had encountered on that floor after the new building had been built, including having a chair slid across the floor at him as he was coming out of a room on a normal round, hearing his name being whispered in his ear, and having something change the stations on his handheld radio on several occasions when he'd entered that floor. I haven't worked there since 2007, and I only know a couple of other people that still work at the hospital, but as far as I know, we were never able to figure out who or what had found its way to that area of the hospital.
I used to be an MP, military police, in the army. The post I was stationed at had a respond to everything policy. So about 50% of our calls were total BS. There was a lady who would call two to three times a week stating stuff like people were unscrewing bolts from the bottom of her car, so just about every MP on post knew this woman. So she calls in one night, talking about a home invasion, saying there were people in her home. So three units are dispatched to her house to meet another MP approaching the front door while the third is at the back of the house. She didn't get a chance to knock on the door. She flings the door open and starts yelling did you see them? They just left. As I asked her, who just left and what were they driving? She just keeps repeating herself. This goes on for a few minutes before I finally get her to calm down and tell me what she believes happened. She looks at me with wide eyes and says, how in the hell did you not see them leave? Their spaceship was just above my house. How the F did you not see them? I said excuse me and she reiterated the fact that she'd just been dropped off by aliens and wanted us to chase down their spaceship. I had a hard time not laughing. But then we had to take her down to the hospital for psychological evaluation. I am a police officer over in the UK and previously really believed in paranormal phenomena. A call came into our control room from a female claiming something strange was going on in her house and she didn't know who else to call. She then went on further to say that things were being thrown across the room and at her and her daughter. The call taker noted that in the background she could hear items being thrown and hitting the walls and floor. They were dispatched to the house and after they had been there for a few minutes, they gave an update that they had had items thrown at them too, seemingly from nowhere. They had searched the premises and there was no other person in the house. They could not explain what was going on in the house and advised the residents to stay with relatives and call an exorcist in the morning. Word got round about the incident and a colleague and partner worked up in the call taking slash dispatch room. We all said it must just be a rumor which had developed and she emailed my colleague the recording of the incident, including the update from the attending officers, which was exactly as above, and as they gave their update, you could still hear items being thrown around inside the premises. I was dispatched to a house at about 1 AM for a prowler. We get there and talk to the residents. Long story short, they saw two people wearing masks, one Jason style hockey mask, don't remember the other, in the yard across the street. It was like two weeks past Halloween, so it seemed believable. We checked the area and didn't see anything. 10 to 8, back in service. It's worth noting the residents didn't seem drunk, high, or crazy at all. A few times, you'll get a similar call and get there to find the resident is strung out on meth and seeing things. However, back to the story. An hour later, we got called back. This time we have our dispatcher on the phone with them while we are surrounding the area. We, about five of us, are in a perfect position. Dispatch tells us they can still see the prowlers in the next yard. We started to move in. The dispatch says the residents saw the two prowlers wave and move into the shed. Guess where I am? That's right, next to the shed. I give verbal commands bang on the door, and nothing. Damn it, fine. I'll come in after you. I didn't notice the doors were open and, empty even think to check for a trap door. Nothing. It is raised about 4 inches, so there isn't even a possibility of a door leading out. Again, check the area and find nothing. I talked to the residents. They said as I was moving in on the shed, the two put their fingers to their lips, giving the shh sign, and then they both waved. They moved into the shed as I was next to it. My exact thought was of the nothing to do here rocket guy. We went over every possibility, 
trying to come up with an explanation. If the caller was just messing with us, they had no prior history of it, as in repeated calls for service at the address. I'm not much of a believer in paranormal stuff, but I can still appreciate a situation where I cannot logically explain what just happened. I was two months out of the academy when the veteran officer I was with got a call from a security officer at an old downtown building. He said the last person to leave said he had heard some weird noises up there. Myself and the other officer made contact with the security man in the lobby. We were told there were strange noises coming from the ninth floor and he got spooked when he went to check it out as he was the only one left in the building. So we pile into the elevator and hit the button and up we go. The doors open to complete darkness. The only light came from an office at the far end of the corridor. As I go to step out of the elevator, a rubber bouncy ball goes bouncing past the elevator. We all froze. I summon some balls and poke my head out to see the ball continue on a straight path down the hall to the only light source up there. Genuinely freaked out at this point, I started shining my flashlight around. As I start making my way down, I walk past a door with a frosted glass window and notice something moving. The door starts rattling furiously, and as I reach towards the knob, a face appears in the frosted glass. At this point, I'm sorry that evolution hasn't seen fit to let us as individuals choose the way we scream as I'm sure mine slightly resembled that of a nine-year-old girl. Everybody starts laughing at me, as I guess I just took part in my initiation. One other officer and the security guy had been in on it and apparently set up well in advance. When I was a kid, I called the cops for a paranormal reason. I was about seven or eight, and I was home alone one day. My family lived in a small two-bedroom house that had been previously used by gangs. Before moving in, I can remember having to get new windows and paint the walls because of how much graffiti there was. Believe what you want to believe, but I remember seeing some crazy stuff in that house. Anyway, this particular time I'm sitting watching a cat or something and I hear a super loud knocking coming from inside the freaking bathroom. As in, I'm home alone and something is knocking to get out of the back room from the inside. I called the police and ran to the park near my house because I was scared and waited for the police. The police went into the house, didn't find anything, and gave me a lecture about calling 911 for emergencies. Fast forward two weeks later, Something must have changed my parents' minds because they freaked out and we ended up putting all of our stuff in trash bags to get out of there as fast as possible and moving in with my grandparents. I can't remember which house it was, but I remember the park. I went back to try to find the place, but I don't remember which house it is. The neighborhood looks way different than it did in the 90s. Final edit. Firstly, I need to clarify some things. I talked to my mom and apparently I wasn't 7 or 8, I was more like 4 or 5 when this happened. In the original post I said I was left at home, but actually my parents were just across the street hanging out with our neighbors when this happened. Anyway, I was about 4 or 5 in the 90s when my parents decided to buy their first home. It was a major fixer-upper. It was previously owned by a really old couple and when they moved, a gang or members of a gang squatted the house. I remember the house was in terrible shape when we bought it. Windows were broken and boarded up, graffiti was everywhere inside the house, the carpet was torn and filthy, and there were at least 20 to 30 yellow-orange traffic cones in the small backyard I used to play in until my parents threw them away. I wasn't allowed in the house much while it was being renovated, but I'd try to find every little excuse to do so. My dad was a sheet metal worker, and sometimes he would find little things I could do. Insert crappy photo of a photo of me at the age of 4 working a dangerous power tool here, after renovating, 
We finally move all of our stuff in. My parents make friends with our neighbors, the stereotypical American dream type life, all is well. From what my mom just told me, we would get really sketchy people coming over trying to visit people who lived there before we did. They'd ask questions like who the F are you? And do you know who X is? And spew rude remarks, but my parents would remain respectful and say things like no, sorry they no longer live here. Or something along those lines. My mom got curious about X. She looked him up in the phone book and ended up finding out that the guy was in jail for drugs or something. She chose to ignore it, and so did my dad. So I'm home alone, my parents are across the street, and I'm eating some oatmeal while watching cat dog. Just imagine a little white boy innocently enjoying some good food he learned to make himself a few days earlier. Then, out of nowhere, I hear an incredibly loud knocking slash banging slash trashing sound coming from the inside of the bathroom. As in, something was trying to get out of the bathroom. The bathroom didn't have a window, so it wasn't possible for someone to get in that way. Plus, the door locks from the inside of the bathroom. Why would someone bang on the door from the inside if they are already in the house? Plus, I remember the light was off in the hallway, so this freaked me the F out. So I call the police and I tell them my address and they tell me to go outside and wait for them, which I do, except I am scared, so I run to a park nearby and wait for them. To be fair, I was four-fifths and the thought of walking across the street to tell my parents didn't even cross my mind. I was scared shitless. As expected, the police searched the house. Blah blah blah. They found absolutely nothing. Okay, yeah, so now I just look like a little fool that abuses 911 and I get chewed out not only by the policeman but also by my parents with an ass whooping. This is where I start to not remember much and my mom still doesn't want to talk about it. What she told me today on the phone was don't look into too much, you'll end up not wanting to know what you find and so I probably won't because whatever freaked my parents out, caused us to move out of that house, fast. I remember being rushed to put all of my clothes, toys, and whatever else I had in black trash bags because there was no time to organize things into boxes. Both my parents took off work for a week, and I was no longer allowed to go home, so I stayed with my grandparents until we found a new place. After that, my parents started going to church every Sunday. They just became completely different people. Whatever happened, whatever they found or saw or heard, messed with them for life. I'd rather not look into it. You guys are welcome to look at past crimes in that area, and that's probably where I would start, and maybe the Reddit detectives can figure out which house it was, or maybe what happened, but I really don't even want to know what happened. I'll answer questions as best I can if you have any. This isn't a story about being an officer but my mom calling the police after seeing a man in my closet. I went upstairs and heard someone talking in my closet. The light was on, which was odd because I turned it off before we left, we just got home, I went downstairs and told my mom. About 5 minutes later, she and my brother ran down the stairs screaming call the cops. There's a man in the house. My dad grabbed the phone and my dog and ran everyone outside. My mom told us she saw a man starting to step out of the closet. When the police arrived, they searched the entire house and yards and told us they couldn't find anyone. The activity continued for a few weeks before we moved out. It still scares me. So my brother is a police officer and he received a call to do a search of an area after multiple. 25 to 30, calls of a small plane on fire. He contacted the air traffic control for the area and they confirmed that there had been some radar contact that went off screen and they gave him coordinates to work from. He searched the area and found nothing. 
He called the air traffic control again and talked to the same person. This person denied any knowledge of the previous conversation or any report of any missing aircraft and hung up. His dispatcher then indicated that he was to go back on regular patrol. While leaving the area, he passed a number of blacked out Humvees, probably JTF-2, proceeding in the opposite direction of his travel. When later, he went to pull up the call on his computer to make notes, all records of it were gone. He decided it was best not to ask any questions. I wasn't technically dispatched on a paranormal call, but was dispatched on a report of a possible home invasion by the neighbors of an elderly man. They reported seeing someone moving rapidly inside and around the home and hearing glass breaking, loud bangs, and what seemed like furniture being toppled over. I was closest to the home, so I pulled up and noticed the lights were all off, neighbors said they saw lights on and the people inside, called for backup because the situation felt odd, and I knew the neighborhood, which was a fairly quiet and upper class community. Two officers came a few minutes later, and we knocked on the door. A few minutes later, a frail older gentleman answered the door in a robe, he had obviously been asleep and was not really comprehending exactly what we were asking. We asked if everything was okay, and he invited us in to see, and the place was absolutely immaculate. He was a retired military officer and his house was perfectly in order except for the sheets and blanket on his bed. We walked around the house, he was very friendly and generous with allowing us to investigate but we really didn't need to because the place was in perfect order, and we checked about as meticulously as one could do visual inspections expecting something much worse. What really got me was the fact that the neighbors saw the movement, lights, and noises only two to three minutes before I showed up and ten minutes before my backup was there. It would have been impossible to clean up broken anything in that time and return the house to that condition by the time we knocked on the door. He also had tons of little trinkets and glass awards and other stuff on his shelves, things that had obviously not moved in a very long time. He walked outside with us and the neighbors were outside too, and they ran over and were like oh my god, are you okay? And he was smiling and said, I'm okay. What happened? They explained what they saw and he just laughed with them and they were giving hugs and kind of walked back to their houses. When he was done, I just curiously asked are you married sir? And he said sadly, my beautiful wife and my son passed some years ago, I miss them dearly, and it kind of sent a chill down my spine. I asked him if he knew why they would hear that kind of noise and he responded, honestly no, I'm usually pretty quiet, and I've lived here more than 25 years and have never so much as seen a bike stolen. The guy was so frail he couldn't have held down a puppy much less a human being, and his movements while we walked with him would have made it impossible for him to pick up an overturned piece of furniture. It always creeped me out and always made me think that his house was haunted. We always kind of had a joke that he had a dungeon in his basement too, but I moved on to a federal position, so I never had a chance to follow up with it. I work in a large western park. Shortly after my wife and I were married, we were doing an off-trail hike, which she had never done before. The route went up a steep gully then dropped into a granite-lined creek bottom. It's a beautiful day, not a cloud in the sky, but not too hot. After getting to the bottom of the drainage and skinny dipping in an amazing natural swimming pool, we continued up the creek, hopping boulders third classing a few sections and having a great time. Out of the blue, my wife, who is intelligent, educated, astute, and very intuitive, starts freaking out, I don't like this. We've got to get out of here. I mean it, we need to go now. Typically, I would be irritated as she was changing our route from an easy granite scramble to a brush snorkeling nightmare. This time it doesn't bother me, though because she is genuinely gripped and I know something she doesn't. About 10 years ago, 
a lost hiker died very close to where my wife started tripping. As soon as we get a few hundred yards out of the drainage, she expresses her relief and says she's feeling much better. We end the day nicely without further ado. The next day, I go to the stacks and pull this dead hiker's case file. I state with a high degree of confidence that where my wife started flipping out is where this hiker's body was recovered. I have no explanation for this other than there is something else going on. Not exactly a police officer, but when I was in the army, my squad leader had some pretty bad PTSD from Panama and Desert Storm. His issues weren't bad enough for a medical discharge, but he would never get promoted past staff sergeant either. For a while, his room was next door to mine, and he would wake me up at least once a week because vampires were in his room. After several weeks, I realized he woke me up at the same time, between 2 a.m. and 2.15 a.m., every week and said the same thing to me when I opened the door, hey, you gotta check my room. You've got vampires in there. Got to check it. Got a Newport? I didn't even smoke Newports, but he asked me that every single time. I never found a vampire, but he wouldn't go back to bed until his room had been cleared. I'm not sure what I would have done if I had found one. When I was working my way through university, I worked as a security supervisor at the local psychiatric hospital. We had a mix of old buildings and modern buildings that were meant to replace the older ones. The oldest building on site was built in 1856 and was exactly what you would envision a Victorian insane asylum to be, 18 inches thick brick outer walls, 12 inches thick inner walls, steel doors that must have weighed easily 400 pounds each, 25 tall ceilings, and a series of underground tunnels that connected the building to the rest of the hospital. When I started working there, the building still held approximately 200 patients, but a couple of years later, those patients were moved to one of the new buildings that had just completed construction, and the old building was closed. The maintenance staff went through and cannibalized the place for parts, pipes, light bulbs, locks, you name it. I was working a day shift and I personally escorted the local telephone company through the building, removing all the phones and making sure all the lines were disconnected. A few weeks later, I was working the night shift and we got a call from the hospital switchboard telling us that she had the police on the line and they were reporting a telephone call coming from inside the old building. I asked her to check the number as I knew there were no phones in the building. She confirmed the number and then told me that the police had been receiving calls every few minutes for over two hours and that it sounded like someone was breathing heavily into the phone and, at other times, like they were holding a conversation while holding their hand over the mouthpiece. As the supervisor, part of my job was security in that building. I had to go through each floor of the building every two hours. Because it sounded like someone was in there, I took another guard with me and we searched all four floors and the basement tunnels, nothing. We just get back to the guard post when the operator calls again and says there are more phone calls coming from the building and the police are demanding we get it to stop. So, back we go, and this time I physically checked off every place that had a phone. The only ones I couldn't get to were the elevator phones because the elevators were locked down. Even as we were in there, we were told by the operator that there were phone calls coming in from various parts of the building. It went on like that for pretty much all night. I passed the info along to the day shift, and when I got in the next night, they told me that the telephone company had come in and inspected everything and found that the main trunk going to the building had actually been severed, so there was no possible way for a phone call to be made from the building. They also looked at the possibility of old numbers being reassigned and found that they had not. This continued for several weeks off and on and then stopped completely. We never found out the actual explanation. 
There was an old couple who lived in a rundown ranch house about 20 miles east of town. When the husband passed away, the woman would call 911 at least three times a week, asking for assistance with very mundane tasks not normally dealt with by first responders. I need help turning the thermostat up. I need help boiling water for my tea, etc. The woman developed dementia, and eventually it progressed to the point where she believed she was calling 911 to ask her deceased husband for help. All of the dispatchers would recognize the address immediately, even though all she could say was, husband's name, I need help. Please come home and help me. One day she called, and again was only able to repeat her husband's, I'll call him John, name. John, I need help. Please come home and help me, John. By the time the first responders arrived on the scene, they found the woman lying dead in her bed. The first unit on the scene called dispatch to confirm that it was the woman herself who had called 911, as rigor mortis had already set in. We wrote it off as the fact that the heater in her house wasn't working, and the ambient temperature in the room was about 50 degrees. We continued to receive 911 calls from that woman at that address for just over a year after she passed away. Even after her home was vandalized and burned to the ground, the phone calls did not stop. John, I need your help. John, please come home and help me. We were obligated to send a response each and every time, but not once did we find anyone on or near the property. Multiple calls to the phone company confirmed that the phone line had been disconnected, and the call was not coming from another address. John was a police officer. He got a call from the dispatcher. Just one more puff, Randy, he told the recruit. It was Randy's first night, and it was quite obvious he was nervous. His shoulders were scrunched up and he kept a hand on his gun whenever they talked to people on the streets. He did seem a little better than on his first day, but it was still not acceptable. John blew the smoke out the window and regretted having to write Randy a bad review. The number was 1677 Victoria. It was a quaint street with not much through fare. Old maple trees decorated the streets and obscured much of the light that came in. The houses on this street weren't entirely well kept, but it wasn't a poor neighborhood, either, which is why the call struck John as particularly odd. As they turned the corner into Victoria, Randy visibly got more tense. He was fidgeting with the safety latch on his gun and had his other hand firmly grasping his thigh. His eyes were darting, Johnny could see, but his head was not turning, as if to hide the fact that he was particularly nervous. Hey, Randy. Wanna hear something funny? Huh? Ah uh, yes. Sure. What's it about? Well, before you came into the force, there was this crazy old lady that kept talking about a ghost in her house. She'd go on and on about the ghost messing stuff up around her house, you know. Crazy stuff. And every time she called, someone would get dispatched and just tell the lady, well ma'am, we couldn't find anything out of the ordinary. If you keep having problems, feel free to call us again. Randy seemed to be relaxing a little. Why you mean people sometimes even call us for help with ghosts? Ha <laughs> ha, that's silly stuff right there. Yeah, I know, right? But she was pretty old, so you had to be kind. Part of being on the force is being friendly with the citizens. That's who we serve, you know? It's pretty important stuff. Don't forget that when the chief calls you in for the interview, Randy pulled out his notepad and scribbled something down. John continued. Yay anyways. One day, I got a call from dispatch saying this woman called us again. I go in all serious and ask if she has a two liters plastic bottle. Puzzled, Randy replied, huh? Why a plastic bottle? To catch the ghost. I make this whole show of going upstairs, making a ruckus, 
and smoking a cig and blowing the smoke into the bottle. By the way, she had an interesting house. It was a three-floor house, and the second floor had this lounge area. I didn't go into any of the rooms because they were all closed, but she really kept the place neat. Anywho, I come out all out of breath and tell the lady, ma'am. I've got the ghost. I've got the ghost. She thanked me a zillion times and I left. That's a funny story, John. Randy had his hand off his gun now, and crossed his legs. His shoulders opened up and it was clear that he was a little more relaxed than before. Yeah, her house is 1,673, a couple houses down from where we're called to actually. We'll pass it as we go. John paused. He slammed on the brakes. What's wrong? 1,673, 1,673, where's the house? i hold on. You said the call's 1,677, and the house next to it is 1,675. 1,673 should be right here. Randy pointed to 1,673. It was in poor shape, with the seven hanging at an angle and the mailbox full of junk. A light gleamed from a bedroom on the second floor, and a frail figure stood against the windowsill. Yes, yes, that must be it. Didn't you say the house was a three-story? That's not her house. A chill ran down John's spine. As a former security guard, I can't count the times I had weird experiences at old schools. But the creepiest one was when I went to an alarm response, and being by myself, I did an external check of the building but didn't go in, as singleman cars didn't carry keys. Anyway, external completed, no obvious cause for the alarm, and I finished my paperwork. There was no mailbox, so I put the attendance report under the admin door. As I was doing so, the report was snatched out of my hand from the other side with such force that the paper ripped. I should add that the building was all armed and was not in the area of alarm. I decided then that it was time to move on to the next school. Quickly. My close mate's dad is a barrister for the Office of Public Prosecution in a state in Australia. He told me once of a case he was involved in, in which a group of four friends did a wiggy no idea how to spell it, but phonetically that will do, bored at one of their houses. Long story short, they got scared and went home. That night, the girl whose house it was died suspiciously. The friends told the police what had happened and were cleared. They went to the funeral and back to the house for the wake. The three friends left in the same car, the guy who was driving was talking and, in mid-sentence, stopped. The girl in the front seat was staring at him, asking what was wrong. He then turned, looked at the girl in the back seat, smiled, and deliberately crashed the car, killing himself and the girl in the front seat. I'm not sure what happened other than the girl in the back survived to tell the story. We used to regularly get calls from this lady about demons getting in her apartment. So we used to crack a chem light and hang it on her door handle. She'd call back in a month or so saying it was time for a new one. We kept this up for a couple years until the old lady passed away. Made her whole month to see us come and hang the ghost repellent. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.